When I was browsing a local antique store, I found this pretty old but interesting radio. Apparently, it is very useful for emergency situations, since you don't need to plug it in or even bring your own batteries. That is because you can charge it up in three different ways. First, you can leave it outside to charge using the solar panel when it is sunny outside. You can also crank the shaft, which is a dynamo generator. And finally, you can plug it into a 3 volt DC power source to get it to work. The rest of it isn't really that special. There's an antenna that extends a few feet. You can also select between FM and AM channels. And finally, there's an audio jack at the back as well. The only problem is that it doesn't work as it should. So the question is, should we fix it or should we scrap it? Let's find out. Let's begin by figuring out what exactly is wrong with this thing. The first time that I powered it on, I thought it actually worked, but quickly realized that it has an incredibly short runtime of only a few seconds. The front panel reads that the radio should be left in the first charging option when not in use, which is the solar option. That made me realize that my recording light was the thing that was briefly charging the radio up. However, it wouldn't stay powered even though it was constantly underneath the light source. I also tried the sunlight, but it got similar results. What about the dynamo charging? That should work, right? Well, no. I cranked this thing for a while and didn't even get to turn on, so something is definitely wrong with it. To make matters worse, the antenna actually broke off the radio while I was using it. Not actually that big of a deal, but kind of annoying to say the least. I tried one more thing that I thought surely would make the radio work. I put in the optional batteries in the slot located at the back of the case. They were both AA rechargeable batteries, and they did kind of work. They were able to power on the radio, but with very poor quality. The audio was very quiet, and attempts to turning up the volume did not work. This is strange, considering that this is a very consistent power source. This means that there is an internal power delivery issue inside of the radio. So, I grabbed my screwdriver and started to open the case up. There were six screws on the back, which were easy enough to get out. Upon opening it, I immediately recognized a few things. First, the yellow and red wires were obviously the positive and negative connections to the battery pack. The white wire led directly to where the antenna used to be. We can also see how the dynamo charging was implemented here. There's a motor attached to a gearbox. Close inspection shows that the gearbox is meant to speed up the rotation when it finally reaches the motor. The motor then spins and generates a current on its terminals. In case you are confused about how this works, apply a current to the motor and we'll make it a spin. Inversely, applying a torque to the motor will generate a current. Continuing, we can also see two sockets with the 3 volt charging and the headphone out. At the top, we find the solar panel, nothing too surprising there. So far, at least visually, nothing seems to be wrong. Although, the age of this design meant that a ton of flakes were coming off the case, making a huge mess. Every time I moved it, it seemed like more and more stuff would just come off the case. Anyways, we can only do so much by only looking at the back of the board. So I started to take it off, but I had problems doing that. I looked for screws and found a couple of them, but the board still wouldn't move. I looked around and realized that there was a screw that somehow blended in and caused me to miss it. So I removed that one too, but the board still wouldn't budge. I checked again for more screws, but didn't find any. That was when I realized that the dials in the front were stopping me from moving the thing. I thought that I could simply just pull off the dial from the board using pliers. Unfortunately, that went wrong, and I ended up destroying the component underneath. This is a really annoying design because it's almost impossible to remove the front case without removing the dials. But to remove the dials, you need to remove the front case. Kind of a paradox. Anyways, because of the physical damage I caused, this is looking more like a scrap, but I kept going with the repair anyways. Thanks to the destruction of the dial, I was able to access the other side of the PCB. As expected, there are a ton of inductors and capacitors. It is a radio after all. There was even a sneaky component that the designers put underneath the IC. There was also another larger inductor that isn't directly attached to the board and was instead glued underneath the case. The speaker that is used is a quarter watt A ohm speaker. The blue cylinder that we can see is actually the battery that should be charged by the charging methods we discussed earlier. It is a two cell, 2.4 volt, 200 milliamp hour nickel cadmium battery. We can finally get to arguably the most informative component, the IC. There's only one IC on this board, and it is the Sony CXA1191. Looking at the datasheet, it is a one chip FM AM radio IC, which is to be expected. 
Its voltage range is 2 to 8.5 volts. It provides a detailed pin description with little schematics to describe the equivalent circuit on the IC. It also provides an example schematic, which will be very useful for debugging anything that we may have to debug. Using these observations, it is time to get the scene to work. The first thing that I must do is replace the component that I broke earlier. Based on the front panel, the example schematic in the datasheet, and visual inspection, I deduced that this component is a combination of a volume potentiometer and a power switch. My meter shows that the destruction has messed up what is left of the component and the terminals are shorted together. At this point, it's simply better to replace it. However, this is the first time that I've ever seen a component like this, so I simply decided to split it into two. I will use a switch and a potentiometer separately. To replace it, I first removed all the old stuff. I then cut and stripped two lengths of wire to attach the new switch. Then I cut more wire for the potentiometer. After soldering the potentiometer, I put electrical tape over some of the exposed contacts and then hot glued it to the board. With that out of the way, I put the board back to its initial state and we can search for the main problem that was causing issues before. If you go back to the beginning of the video, you'll remember that the radio seemed to have an issue holding any sort of charge. So let's begin by inspecting the battery. The age of the battery should be another indicator that it needs to be replaced. So I took the battery out of its spot for inspection. Since this is a 2 cell NICAD, we should be getting about 2.4 volts. These batteries have a very stable voltage throughout their capacity, so a dead battery should be a very low voltage. Measuring the voltage reveals that we get a voltage of 1.5 volts, so about 0.75 volts per cell. That is a considerable amount lower than the usual 1.2 volts, not to mention that the ICE requires at least 2 volts total to properly function. So as a test, let's apply 2.5 volts directly using my power supply. and it works exactly as expected. The battery is the problem. Great, now we just need to find a replacement for this battery. The problem is I don't have anything shaped like this on hand. In fact, I don't even have any NICADs on hand either. So I had to look for another solution. A LiPo most likely would not be suitable for this application due to its sensitivity. Coin cells and button cells wouldn't be great either. What I did have, however, was a few rechargeable NIMH batteries, which should work in a fashion similar enough to NICADs. Before we put the batteries into the circuit, however, let's see exactly how they will be charged. Starting with the solar panel, I put it underneath my recording light. Measuring the voltage on the output will get us 1 volts. I'm sure that it would be much higher were we to place it in direct sunlight. The motor is similar, and spinning it outputs a few volts on the terminals. It helps too that the shaft is connected to the gearbox for a higher RPM. Now that we have our power inputs, how exactly are they connected to the battery? Well, the three state switch, as we know, switches between charging methods. The connection isn't direct, because if it were, the battery would force the motor to spin. To find out what is in between the battery and the chargers, we should look at the board. As we can see, there are two diodes. One is for the solar panel, and one is for the motor. This is to make sure that the current only flows into the battery and not the other way around. So I got a AA battery case to hold the new batteries. And directly connecting the new batteries in place of the old battery provides success. But using this battery container would be a bit inconvenient. So I came up with another solution. Remember the optional battery slot at the back of the radio that doesn't work? Well, we can rewire it to directly connect it in place of the old battery instead and use our new batteries to accomplish the same task. And that concludes all of the electrical issues, and now it is time to reassemble everything. But first, I have to make a spot for this new switch that was added to the radio. To do that, I simply just drill the hole using my drill press. Now it's actually time to put everything back together. And after doing that, it looks good as new and works just as well. I'm glad to see this radio in proper working order again. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video and like seeing this radio being restored. Maybe it has inspired you to repair something that you have. Anyways, please consider subscribing so that you can see the other videos that I make. Have a good one!